Hello and welcome once again to CS441 541 Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well out there in these difficult times. Welcome to another lecture. And today we are going to be talking about heuristic search. Last lecture we talked about the fundamentals of complete search. And what we want to talk about this time is heuristic complete search and an algorithm that's actually a very popular and strong algorithm for doing that. And so let's dive in and talk about that. So what's a heuristic? A heuristic is just a guess. And in particular, in search, we usually use heuristics that talk about making progress toward our goal. Remember, the definition of AI we're using is that we're solving intellectual goals and in the achieving intellectual goals in the face of intellectual obstacles. And in search, the goal is literally a goal. I'm in some state and I want to find some traverse the state spacecraft to find some goal state. And the intellectual obstacle here is mostly that the space is big. And so it's very hard to know how to go there. And so far we've been going blind. None of the techniques we've used so far have any idea where they're going. They have no idea whether a move is going the right direction or the wrong direction in the state space. And that's a real problem. And it makes search very hard. If that's really your situation, there's only so much you can do to make things work. You're probably stuck with very small instances of or problems with very small state spaces or something because you know, you're going to have to explore a lot of it to make it anywhere. And we talked last time about breadth first search and depth limited, you know, depth first iterative deepening as techniques to say, well, Maybe I at least know the goals nearby and I can take advantage of that. But as we saw, we still aren't solving 15 puzzles and so that's kind of a problem. So one of the observations we made a while back that you've made too, I'm sure, is that the sort of natural human strategy is to try to put one tile in place at a time. We notice that right here, tiles one and two are already in place. And so the next thing naturally to do if you just are solving it in the obvious human way is to solve tile three. And so an obvious heuristic to use is, well, number of tiles in place, right? You tend to want not to want to displace a tile if you can avoid it, if you have tiles in place. And if I want to move this tile to where it goes, which is here, well, then my heuristic is going to be to try to find moves that bring it closer to the goal. I'm, I don't really want to move it backwards. This seems like a counterintuitive move because it actually makes it farther out of place than it was before. So instead, I might choose to move some other tile that didn't make it farther out of place. Now, notice that I sort of have some idea of things in the way, too, as a human being, that I want to get out of the way. And so that's something we might want to take into account. The number of in-the-way tiles might be a thing. But that's sort of transitive, and it's hard to compute. But at the very least, we can sort of say, well, let's try to get four in place. Now let's try to get five into place, which I can move either one of these, and then five is closer to into place, and then I got to get this out of the way, and then I can move this closer. And now it's just a matter of getting six into place, but oh, wait, uh, that's a problem because I, without displacing a tile, I can't do anything useful, right? If I do this, well, maybe I can, let's see. So let's try moving six into place. Notice I had to move four and five, so now I have less tiles in place. But now I can put five back in place, now I can put four back in place, and now I'm done. So human beings use heuristics a bunch when they're solving these puzzles. And if I uh, think about it, maybe there's some way we can teach our search 
to be like that, to sort of take into account which moves look like they're making progress and which moves look like they're anti-progress and prefer to try moves that make progress. That seems like a sensible thing to want to do. And this lecture, I'm going to concentrate on complete search and sort of the classic algorithm for using heuristic information with a complete depth first search. Uh, in future lecture, we'll talk about going back to our idea of random search and strengthening that with a heuristic and seeing how that goes. But for now, no, there's this heuristic. But you know, why do we use that heuristic? Why is trying to put the one tile in place first such a natural thing for humans to do? Well, because we don't have very big memories. We don't have very good memories. And so we're sort of stuck with heuristics that human beings can execute reliably, right? And I can sort of reliably remember which tile am I working on now, right? And which tiles do I, and I can just look at it and see which tiles would I like not to disturb. And so this is sort of a human capable characteristic. But if you think about it, there's another measure of close you might use, which is pretty obvious, right? Which is that for each of these tiles, you can tell how far it is from its target position. So right now the one tile is out of place by two, the two tiles out of place by one, the three tile is out of place by one, two, three, and so forth. What if we just add all those up? And what if we try to make moves that reduce the number of out of place tiles? Maybe that's a good heuristic, right? That's called the Manhattan distance heuristic. And so in this position, I could do that for all eight tiles and get a score for this position. And then I could decide which one of these to move, right? Which way to look ahead first based on, well, which one gets things closer to being in place. And that's the heuristic we're gonna mostly work with today is the Manhattan distance heuristic. Notice that this heuristic is great if you're trying to find your way to the solution. Both of these are. But if there isn't a solution, if I were to flip a couple of these tiles so the problem was unsolvable, you know, no heuristic is really gonna help you, right? The, all the heuristic does is guide you to things that are almost solutions really quickly and you give up and say, well, those weren't solutions. And then you're gonna have to search the rest of it to make sure you didn't miss something because the heuristic's a guess, it's an approximation, right? Just because you know the one is two away doesn't mean I can get it there in two moves. I, it's obviously more than that, right? I obviously have to take a minimum of four moves, right? Because I have to get the three and the two tiles out of the way to be able to move that there. And it's probably gonna be more moves than that. So this heuristic is an estimate. Uh, it's not exact. If I had a perfect heuristic that told me exactly what the score of each state was, right? Oh, here I'm, you know, 20, I'm 24 moves away from the goal. And if I move this one, I'm 23 moves away. And I move this one, I'm 25. I wouldn't have to search at all, right? I would just keep going in the direction that kept reducing the heuristic until I got to a heuristic value of zero and I'd be all done. But of course, a perfect heuristic, we don't have any way to do that unless P equals NP. And so we're gonna have to just go with what we got. So one of the things that we should mention as sort of an inspiration for this is Dijkstra's algorithm. You may remember Dijkstra's algorithm from your algorithms class. Dijkstra is an example of what's called best first search. And in, because in Dijkstra, we search for the state, we, we, we keep track of which states we've already tried, and we pick a next state to exhibit that's as close as possible to the starting state the next state to search that's closest to the, as possible to the starting state. So we sort of expand outward in a big circle around the thing. And in a weighted graph where the edge weights, where the cost of the moves aren't all the same, let's imagine a world in which vertical moves cost two and uh, horizontal moves cost one. Well, that means that I'm gonna sort of favor horizontal moves because they're cheaper. Unfortunately, for our sliding tile puzzle, Dijkstra's algorithm is literally exactly best first search. Best first search is Dijkstra's algorithm where all the edge weights are one, and so it doesn't do anything for us here. But it's an important idea, this idea of trying to search states that look good first because those are the ones that we're gonna get. 
And the classic algorithm for this is a thing called A star. Now, before I start here, I should warn you that A star is a bit tricky to understand. It's a one of the you know sort of clever search algorithms. And it's well worth it because it's super powerful, but you're not going to probably get it from my explanation here. I highly recommend that you read the book carefully where it talks about A-star search, the course textbook. And then you might want to come back and watch this again. You might want to watch a YouTube video on A-star search from somebody better at presenting. Uh, it's going to take you some runs at this one, but it's a really neat algorithm and it's really worth thinking about as a way to solve these kinds of problems. So here's the thing. Maybe I shouldn't always search in closest to the goal order, right? If I have some heuristic that tells me that, you know, moving vertically here is likely to be the best thing to do, maybe I should prefer to do that even if you know, these states are closer. Maybe the next thing to do is the heuristic tells me that the next best thing to do would be to move over here. And so that's the idea we're going to use. We're going to use the heuristic to sort of change the search order so that we try to explore it to not just to search states that are close to the start, but states that are getting closer to the goal. And we're going to favor those in the search. So that's the key idea of A star. Now, there's a condition for the heuristics that A star needs. It's not just any condition. Well, first, let's say what we're doing here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, there's an estimate of the distance to the goal and there's an we know how far we are from the start and so rather than using just a plain old cue for like breadth first search does we're going to use a priority cue and the way, what we're going to do is we're going to in queue the nodes such that the next one we pull out of the queue is the one that has the smallest total known distance from the start plus heuristic estimated distance to the goal and if we search in that order instead, then we favor things that look promising. And that's a really cool thing to do. Now, if we favor something that looks promising, we're also disfavoring something that doesn't look prob promising. How do we know we won't guess wrong? How do we know we won't do what depth first search does or random does and just wander around in the search space following always promising looking paths? Meanwhile, there was a short solution down here, but the heuristic guided us away from it. That is be the way we avoid that. So we're going to we're going to call g of s the distance from the state of the state from the origin. We're going to call h of s the heuristic distance of the state to the goal. And the property that we're going to use is that we're going to use a heuristic like Manhattan distance, which is guaranteed to always underestimate, right? Always be optimistic in its estimate. In the case of sliding tiles, it will always underestimate the distance to the goal. And if you think about how Manhattan distance works, that's absolutely a property it has, right? Is that if you add up how out of place each tile is, clearly the solution's at least that far away. It has to be at least that far away because I have to put every tile in place and there's no way to do that without moving them all to their proper place. Now that's a, like we talked about before, that's a real underestimate of how many moves it's gonna take to solve this puzzle, but it's an estimate and it's what's called admissible. And what we're going to do is use admissibility to get a guarantee for A star that if we search or nodes in the order of, if we explore nodes in the order of increasing G plus H, we're still guaranteed that the first solution we find is a shortest solution. So we're going to find shortest solutions, but we're going to find them faster because we'll ignore a bunch of stuff that was in the wrong direction. And that's that's the idea of A star. What heuristics are admissible? Well, like I say, Manhattan distance, admissible heuristic. It always underestimates, right? Uh, distance of 
the next tile out of place, that first human heuristic we tried, is clearly an admissible heuristic, right? Because it doesn't even take into account moving the other stuff. It says, well, we have to move the next tile to put in place at least that far to get where we're going. So that's an admissible heuristic. What's the always admissible heuristic? Well, we can always estimate that we're at the goal, right? We can say, well, our heuristic is just zero. We're always at the goal. That's an admissible heuristic because it always underestimates the true distance. It's not a very useful heuristic, because. but what we'll find is that when we do A star search with the zero heuristic, hey, guess what? It, de de it degenerates to Dijkstra, just like Dijkstra in the case of unit edges degenerates to breadth first search. So we will never do worse with A star than we would with Dijkstra. Dijkstra is always, with an admissible heuristic, A star is always at least as good as Dijkstra in terms of the amount of nodes you have to explore before you find a solution in the state space. And on the other hand, what if we had a perfect heuristic? What if we literally knew how many it is to the solution? Well, then what we'll find is that A star always makes the right decision. It always walks directly, directly from where you're going, right? Because it knows the true distance at each step, it knows how far you've come and it knows the true distance from there to the end, it will always just initially pick the one that's closest. So if we had that, which is impossible, then we would have no search at all. We just walk there in linear time to the solution. Now, so the one of the th tricks with A star is can you find a very accurate heuristic, one that maybe isn't perfect, but at least comes pretty close to estimating the true distance to the goal while still being admissible, because we have to maintain admissibility or we won't get shortest paths at the end. And that's an interesting question. And for sliding tile puzzles, we're not gonna try to tackle it too hard in this one. I, there are some improvements. You know, the obvious improvement to the Manhattan distance heuristic is what I said, right? I really, if there's tiles in the way, I shouldn't just count one, I should count two. And that'll help a little bit with my search, but there's other games like that that I can play to try to increase heuristic values so they're more precise, but not without ever increasing them too much. So the distance to the goal is overestimated. So how does this thing work? So what we do is just like breadth first search or Dijkstra, we put things in the priority queue in the or order of increasing G of S plus H of S, and then we pull out the next unexamined node out of the queue that that looks like it's the you know that 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 we want to look at. We look to see if it's a solution. If it is, then we're done. If it's not, then we mark it as visited and put all its children in the queue so that we can start the next round. But we push it into a priority queue, a min queue, and so we're always pulling out a minimum thing in terms of G plus H. How do we know that this is correct? Well, this is a tricky argument to make in a video. I'm going to try to sort of walk you through it very sort of half-heartedly. It goes like this. Assume that, and there's a better proof in the textbook and there's better proofs elsewhere if you want to look at the details. Assume that I actually got to the goal by some path that wasn't the shortest path. So I was trying to get from here to here and I went around this way, right? Well, then at some point, the heuristic told me to go, G plus H told me to go in a direction that I, well, it's, I can't walk around very well this way. Let's, let's say that I went around like this. At some point, the heuristic told me to go in a direction that wasn't a good direction, right? And so maybe I should have just uh, not done that. What I can show is that at some point I'm about to get to the end. Well, by then I'm pulling nodes out that are shorter, that, that you know, that I'm always pulling out the smallest node. So I've pulled out a node by argument that, you know, by sort of argument that's this node, but we know this node's shorter because the real distance to the goal is shorter. And so you can never get stuck like that. As long as the heuristic's admissible, it's guaranteed, it's provably guaranteed that 
the following this A-star plan will actually walk you, you know, will actually examine it. Back when I was doing this stuff in grad school, we used to talk about the football. If you think about the state space, you know, like I say, you can think of Dijkstra as sort of spheres around the, of equal distance around you. You search sort of outward in a sphere. In a star, you would search out in a kind of a football where you don't ever go backwards very far because the heuristic keeps you from doing it. You don't ever go off to the side too far because the heuristic keeps you from doing it. And so you end up being sort of guided through the search space toward the goal. And when I have football, by the way, I mean an American football. A soccer ball is just a sphere. Um, so here's the original paper by uh, Judea Pearl that, sorry, Niels Nielsen, Hart Nielsen and Raphael, that talks about uh, A-star search for the first time. And so this is an older paper. What is the date on this? 1967. This has been known for a long time. The textbook talks about this. CLRS, the algorithms textbook that you'd use in a graduate algorithms course, um, Corman, Leeserson, Rivest, Shamir, algorithms textbook talks about this. It's a very common algorithm to describe, and you can find formal proofs in discussion. What I was going to say is this was discovered in late 60s, but it didn't really get in much use until the 90s because big state spaces, right, require big, fast computers. Until you have enough memory to store a reasonable number of states, and you have a fast enough CPU to explore states at a reasonable speed, this still isn't a very practical algorithm. And all of a sudden, computers got big, and when computers got big, things fundamentally changed, and we can start using this cool thing. So, this isn't so bad, right? We make our priority queue, we key the priority queue by the distance from the origin plus the estimated distance to the goal. It says no separate stop list is needed. Why? Because all the nodes in the priority queue that that isn't actually true in this situation. So let's pretend we never said that. But in general, if you're searching a space that isn't undirected, then you don't need a stop list in this because you're always guaranteed to go in the right direction. Oh, sorry, you're also guaranteed because yeah, it's complicated. But a lot of times no separate stop list is needed because the heuristic can never guide you back toward a previously visited state. And this is a complete search algorithm. It will stop when all states have been examined, right? It's just like breadth first search. Eventually your queue will empty out and there's nothing more to look at. But of course, in practice, just like breadth first search, just like Dijkstra, it will stop when you run out of memory because these state spaces are too big to fit in or when we run out of patience because it takes a long time to look at that many search states. But in principle, this is a complete search. And in practice, it works pretty good. Let's look at it and try it out and see what it looks like. So uh, uh, let's look at, uh, at it on our three puzzle. If you'll, if you'll remember, breadth first search says there's a distance 24 solution to this, takes a few seconds. And so far, breadth first search is probably the fastest way. I guess we could just time it. That's kind of dumb. Um, so far, breadth first search is probably the fastest way we have to solve this three puzzle. And it solves it in six seconds of real time. It's not unacceptable, but it's not great. You can almost solve it as a human being that fast if once you get good at it. Let's see what A star looks like on this problem. So I've implemented A star. Again, it's part of this slider app. Oh. A tenth of a second. And as we know before, for four puzzles, for 15 puzzles, for ones of side four, um, breadth first search is hopeless. And we could wait for a long time, and this would never finish because it's just too far away. What does A star do for us? Well, this is going to run for a few seconds. But what we're going to find out is after a few seconds, this thing is actually going to get to the end. And for the first time, we've built a program 
that in Python in 16 seconds can solve a 15 puzzle. Sweet. Notice that the solution is 43 moves away from the origin. And what that means is that the state space is just gigantic, right? We argued that the, that, uh, and the solution is pretty close in that state space, relatively speaking, but 43 is still a lot to examine. We have to be pretty accurate to go there that quick. This is a very widely deployed algorithm. This is the basis of the algorithms used to do map location searches. It's the basis of algorithms used to do, to solve all kinds of search problems, satisfiability, all kinds of planning, all kinds of stuff. When I did my doctoral work in planning in grad school, there was an A star based planner that was actually good at finding sh shortest plans in a reasonable amount of time for general purpose planning problems. So that's pretty cool. And so the moral of the story is that using a heuristic is your friend. You really want to try to incorporate knowledge you have. Now, what's the price you pay for the heuristic? Well, my search just got fancier, right? I now don't just have to apply some algorithm that I pull out of a library somewhere. I really have to write the part of it that's specific to the problem I'm working on, right? I had to invent admissible, an admissible heuristic for sliding tile puzzles, and I had to code that up and make sure that it was correct, make sure it was prove that it was admissible. That's a little extra work. We hate trading machine effort for programmer for. Uh, programmer effort usually. I'd rather let the computer work harder so I can work less. But here the I, I'm trading sort of small amounts of programmer effort for exponentially less computer time and memory. So that trade-off will let me tackle a lot larger instances of this problem. Five by five is really hard, by the way. The 24 puzzle is brutal and nothing we've looked at so far really tackles it very well directly. There are some techniques floating around for solving 24 puzzles. For the th um, 35 puzzle, the six by six one, basically nothing works. So these problems, eventually you'll run out of instances you can solve, at least optimally, and really at all. But in the meantime, well, that's not true. The, the 35 puzzle I can solve as long as I don't care about shortest solutions using the same technique we use for all the other ones. It's just long and tedious. And I can build those heuristics into an A-star search and guide it to solutions to the 35, or sorry, not into an A-star search, but into a heuristic search and guide it to solutions to the 35 puzzle. So that's cool. And that's what I have for you today. Heuristic search, good thing. Heuristics, good. We're going to be thinking a lot about heuristics in this course, and not just in search, but in other things. There's a lot of evidence that human beings sort of work on heuristics, that they don't really solve problems at all, including things like playing chess, by systematically exploring a lot of the space. They let the heuristics guide them toward the solution. What we'll talk about next lecture or so is sort of what if we just give up on this idea of completeness which isn't working out very well anyway and just do heuristic guided search without worrying about being systematic about what we're doing and that leads to a whole bunch of other interesting stuff yeah that's what i have for you today as always stay safe and well out there thank you very much for listening and i look forward to talking to you again soon